Oh, good. That worked. Good morning, everybody. How are you? All right. So my talk this morning is innovating in the shadows of success. And I'll give you an idea of what that is about here in a little bit. Um, so another way of thinking about innovating in the shadows of success, at least where I was going with the talk, is how you, we lost our way on the paths to Pearl Six. Uh, places where we got off of the path of actually making progress. And part of it, the, the theme behind it goes back to something that uh, Mark Burgess said on Friday night, if you managed to make it to the panel discussion. Uh, he said it numerous times, which is innovation inside of a successful project is hard. And, oh, better? Yeah, p -p 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 I know, yeah. Um, is that uh, innovation inside of a successful project or inside of a successful organization is often very difficult. And uh, you know, I had come to this conclusion independently while thinking about uh, Pearl Six and, and how Pearl Six has evolved and how it's gotten to its place, that in many ways, some of the difficulties that we've had in getting Pearl Six to where it is is because Pearl Five has worked so well. And so I'll talk a little bit about that. But Talking about all of the ways in which we got lost is kind of depressing, uh, a little bit too negative. So I decided I was going to take another tack to begin with to try and make it a little bit more fun. So the themes for my talk are having fun, um, keeping principles, and I'll talk about what those are here in a little bit, and then I'll get to when success leads us astray. Uh, because I think that um, the, all of these themes will tie together really nicely here in my keynote this morning. Uh, by the way, in looking at uh, this notion of losing our way on the paths to Pearl 6, I decided to just do a Google image search uh, for what you get when you say success and dark side, asking for the dark side of success, and I got this. And uh, so that's Darth Vader saying that the dark side is uh, coming from switching, from an switching to Android, which makes me wonder what the light side would be. Um, but... Uh, uh, I thought that was just interesting that that's the one that came up as a result of that. Um, so a little bit about me, since uh, I'm not too widely famous outside of the Pearl 6 community. Um, so I'm the leader, or one of the leaders for Recuto Pearl 6, which is an implementation of Pearl 6. Uh, I'm also the author of an open source package called PM Wiki, and I'll talk about that a little bit and some of my experience with that. And then uh, because it came up in the... Um, in the uh, panel discussion, I'm also the author of an article called Strawberry Pop Dart Blowtorches. And I'll let you know a little bit about that because that actually feeds into my talk as well. Um, so if I have to say what am I most famous for around the internet, it would be this last item, uh, unfortunately. So having fun, uh, talking about ways of having fun. Uh, I'm going to start with kind of my claim to fame on the internet because the internet and open source really come together. I mean, they grew up together um, and I don't think you could have one without the other. Um, that uh, they are, you know, they're hand in hand with each other um, all the way through the development. So the year was 1994 and in 1994 a new package had just been re released called NCSA Mosaic and it was on top of this thing called the World Wide Web. And this is when the web was first becoming very, very popular. And Mosaic was, of course, the first graphical web browser, or one of the first ones that had any traction of any sort. And I saw this, and my PhD research was actually on hypermedia systems and being able to do these sorts of things um, when I did my PhD dissertation. That was about five years prior to this, and I hadn't done anything with hypermedia systems since then because I finished my PhD and then went off and taught classes and did other things. So the question I had for myself was, okay, we have this new environment. Can we actually use this to produce academic papers? Is it a valid publishing medium. And that wasn't necessarily known at the time if you could do that. Um, but in the same time, I said, well, I want to test this, but I don't want to do any real work. So, because that would be boring. I didn't want to do anything that would be boring. And so I decided I would publish an article on the web. Now, at the time, the web had fewer than a thousand servers. That's how new it was. There weren't that many servers. So we had, we had a server set up uh, and a variety of other things. And for those of you who don't know what a Pop-Tart is, that's a Pop-Tart. It's a little pastry that is sold uh, primarily in the United States. It has a fruit filling. Well, they call it fruit. Um, 
it has a fruit flavored filling uh, that is inside of it and it's often frosted. And the notion is, is that uh, you can get up in the morning and you put one of these in the toaster and that would be your breakfast. And uh, you know, heat it up and then be able to eat it. Children love it because it's full of sugar and all sorts of bad things for them. Um, adults like me love it because it's full of sugar and bad things for me. Uh, and so on. So uh, a newspaper columnist named uh, Dave Barry, he was a, column, a humorist, had written an article about what happens when you have a Pop-Tart left in a toaster for too long. And um, I decided this was something that science really should investigate. And so I needed to reproduce the results and write that up as if it were some sort of a scientific paper. So I wrote an article and published it on the web, and it's called Strawberry Pop-Tart Blowtorches. So this is the early days of the web, right? We were amazed that we could even get graphics into web pages. The image tag had just been invented uh, at this time. And I'm going to try and pull up the actual website here. Here it is. So for strawberry Pop-Tart blowtorches, and I formatted it as if it is an actual article. So, you know, in, if you look at scientific articles, you know, you have an ops author, you have an abstract that describes what the article's about, and I had an introduction. This is a science experience experiment, so you have to indicate all of the materials that are being used. Here are the various materials being used. Um, this is the Pop-Tart, that's the toaster that was being used in order to uh, cook it. Um, you talk about how you prepare the experiment. And uh, again, this was something I wanted to see because unlike a printed article, you can now have hyperlinks. So uh, you could actually go and link to the photo and get a nice close-up of the photo. So here's my laboratory assistant um, putting the Pop-Tart into the toaster. If you notice very carefully, we've held the toaster lever down with cellophane tape so that it will not eject the Pop-Tart. And we want to see what will happen. And to uh, get to the, uh, the punchline, so to speak. Uh, we take it to the appropriate uh, laboratory area, this being the driveway outside my house. Um, we document our observations, and you end up with something like this. Right? And that comes up after about a minute. So I did a time-lapse photo here. This was five photos that I later photoshopped together and, and put it together. This article went viral on the web. I mean, the, it was incredible how quickly that it had, put to, had you know, come together and done all of these things. Um, and uh, because it was written as, uh, in, in a way that was supposed to be somewhat humorous. Um, after that, we had to figure out how to put out the flames. So we put out the flames, and then we had to do a hazardous waste disposal, um, which was simply putting it out in the rubbish bin uh, out, by, uh, out by the side of the house. Um, one of the things that the internet, I discovered, did give me was the ability to get comments back from people. And this, of course, gets into collaboration, peer-to-peer, -peer and so on. So I, I did get some comments back um, from it. Um, one of the first comments that I got back and this just led me to realize just how weird the web was going to be, is that somebody said they figured out I had doctored the photo and that this was really upside down, that what we were seeing was a strawberry Pop-Tart propelled rocket motor jammed against the ceiling. <laughs> and so I had to acknowledge that, okay, I had been found out that I had falsified my research, apparently. Um, and then the next one came from somebody who wrote that they were going to uh, report me to the authorities. Uh, in particular, the Occupational Safety and Hazard Administration, which is the um, one that is, it's the organization in the United States that is responsible for protecting workers. Because they had gone through and analyzed one of the photos and discovered that there was a bare foot in the reflection of the toaster and that that foot should have been covered by a protective boot of some sort, by some sort of uh, foot protection device, and therefore they were reporting me to the authorities for having failed to uh, equip my laboratory assistant properly. Um, my laboratory assistant at the time was my girlfriend, but hey. <laughs> so uh, that was my, my uh, foray into the internet and um, you know, publishing things on the internet. Uh, the, the punchline to this, besides you know, the internet can be fun, uh, is that it got an incredible amount of 
play, and I still get uh, results from it even to this day. As soon as I can get back to my slideshow. Hello, slideshow. There we go. So uh, just to give a couple of examples, so this was published in 1994. It showed up in dozens of newspapers and magazines throughout the United States where it got referenced. I had calls from lawyers who wanted to have me go into a courtroom to explain to the judge or jury about the dangers of Pop-Tarts because the lawyers' clients had their houses or apartments catch fire when the toaster failed to eject the Pop-Tart and they weren't watching it uh, at the, that particular time. Um, so I was asked to be an expert witness. In 1999, my article was translated into German and published in a book. This is a physical book that I can buy, and I have several copies from, that I bought from Amazon that has my article completely translated into German so that I'm there. And then how many of you know who George Takei is from Star Trek? Right? I, well, you got to check, right? This is the room where it would do it. He posted it. It's last week, two weeks ago, All right? That's the photo from my article showed up in his newsfeed of things that he sends out. And here it is, you know, some 21 years later. Um, the internet is a weird place. Uh, the internet is just, you know, lots of things happen uh, that are there. And it's a place to have fun. So, now that I have Pop-Tarts out of the way, anybody know why Linux was created? The correct answer is, for fun. How many of you have read Linus's book that was covered? I mean, basically, why did he do it? It was for fun. It was a fun project. Right, it's an excellent book if you haven't read it. It's been out for quite a while. But, you know, again, just talking about fun. Because for us, in working in Perl 6, and for me, working on the internet and in open source, it comes down to having fun, much more than anything else. And I'm a person that lives to have fun. In the Perl 6 uh, environment, we even um, make it explicit on our website. So if you go to the Perl6.org website, there's a tab there called Fun. And you can learn that Perl 6 is optimized for fun. And we have this nice little notation of being able to say it, dash capital O F U N means optimize for fun. If you know the GNU C compiler, then you know dash capital O means optimize, and then fun. So um, fun is a big important part of the things that we do. And in open source, I think it's important, at least for me, to keep that aspect of open source going and have it, uh, have it be uh, a part of what you do. So just keep fun back, because I'm going to come back to the notion of fun here in a little bit. So next is on principles. Because the other part that's important to me about open source is knowing what your principles are. Um, and in talking about principles, for me, open source ultimately is really more about community than code. Right? Um, and that's what I found in working with PMWiki, my wiki software package. Um, there, we have a commons. We have a, a, a commons, this is a place where people gather, where people share resources, those sorts of things. And that's what open source is really about. It's really about people contributing to a common sort of thing. And uh, when we're talking about communities, we're talking about shared values and shared visions for whatever it is that we're trying to achieve. And whatever it is we're trying to achieve consists of personal goals, very selfish goals, and also community goals, what we want to achieve for the community and things that are happening there. So, my next claim to fame would be this software package called PMWiki. And it's wiki software that was created in 2001. It was loosely based on what was called Usmod Wiki at the time. So, Usmod Wiki, uh, in the early 2000s is when wikis were really starting to, to take off. And um, I, I found out about WikiWiki Webs and realized that they could potentially solve a problem I had within the research project that I was working on at the university. Uh, we had a problem of keeping documentation up to date because every time somebody wanted to change documentation, they would have to go to the webmaster and tell the webmaster, would you please make this change to the website? And the webmaster was the only one who had permissions to do that. And I said to myself, wait a minute, if I have a wiki, then anybody can change things. If the wiki is designed in a way to be able and uh, um, so that anybody can edit the web pages directly. 
Um, so I ended up writing, uh, I looked at several uh, wiki engines. I started with UseMod Wiki because it was written in Perl and it looked like it would do a lot of the things I wanted to do. I quickly became frustrated with it uh, and it didn't look to me like it was something that I would be able to patch in the way I wanted to do, so I decided to write my own. Um, and after about six or so months, I said, well, I'm really interested in open source and I'd like to get involved in open source somehow. I'll just release this. Let's see what happens. I'll just make it into a tarball, start creating releases, and see what happens. And within a couple of months, I started getting patches back from people who said they had found it, downloaded it, were using it. And I was kind of you know, surprised by that. But that's the way open source is supposed to work. And nowadays, there's thousands of installations worldwide. Um, I have to show my favorite one because this one shocked me when it showed up on my doorstep. Arduino.cc. So many of you are familiar with Arduinos. This is their website. It's running my software. I had no idea. <laughs> um, and I know it's running my software because I can go to the page that describes it. So if I go to the Arduino page, there it is. That's the about page for the software for Arduino. And the way I found out about this is because they sent me a donation. They sent me a nice big donation for PMWiki um, at some point. And that's a little bit of an interesting story in and of, it, of itself because the way the donation came in is they sent me an email that said, we would like to send you money. Please give us your bank account number and we will send it to you. <laughs> right, you know? And um, so if any of you got that message, what would you do? You'd delete it, right? Right? I was poised over the delete key. And then I said, wait a minute, what if this is real? And that's the point at which all the alarm bells should be going off in your head. But I went and, and looked at the headers in the email, and it looked legitimate. It looked like it came from the Arduino folks. So I forwarded the message back to the real contact address for Arduino and said, is this real? And I got a response back and said, yes, it's real. Send us your account number. And <laughs> It was like, <laughs> you do realize this sounds like a phishing attempt, like, you know, um, whatever. And they said, yes, we know, but we have, you're in the United States, we're in Italy, we don't have an easy way to get you the money other than by a wire transfer, so send us your bank account number. So uh, I opened up another bank account uh, just for that, put a little tiny bit of money in it and said that's the most they'd be able to take me for. Sent them that bank account number and didn't hear from them for several months, and then several months later, all of a sudden, a nice little... Uh, bit of money showed up. Um, open source is surprising that way, um, which is really, really nice. And I've had other things happen like that as well. Um, it's, I'm sorry, it's written in PHP, yes. It's written in PHP. So <laughs> you just went and looked it up? Yeah, okay, so I have written PHP and I'm actually proud of it. Um, now, that, I mean, that brings up another point, which is, you know, I'm a Perl guy, right? And I've been doing Perl since 1991, too. 1992. I've been doing Perl since version 4.0. Why in the world would I choose to do my PM Wiki package in PHP? And the answer was, it was a better tool for the job. Because my audience... Um, well, let me, let me go to the next slide and I'll come back to that question, actually. It's still a very active community. Um, another open source principle is that if you leave a project, you should always identify a successor. And I've been fortunate enough that I've had some successors come up. And so I have not written a line of code for this project since about 2006. But it is still actively maintained. It has a very active community. And it's worked out very, very well. Part of the reason for that is because early on in the project, I defined what was called the PM Wiki philosophy. And these were five principles that defined the scope of the project. 
and it said, these are the principles by which we will accept changes into the project. And so some of them, uh, the first one was favor writers over readers, which was make it easier to author, author content than to read it. Um, another one was don't try to replace HTML. My goal was not to create yet another HTML editor that just happened to work online because I thought they were all really crappy. So um, don't try and make it just an HTML replacement. That was a core principle for us. Um, didn't want to just add features because we could think, think of them, what are called gratuitous features. Um, the whole point of the, having this package was to support collaborative maintenance of public websites. And you can see Arduino does that, and I had it for several projects of my own. And lastly, it was to be easy to install, configure, and maintain. And PHP wins in 2001 when compared to Perl on those three counts. Uh, PHP is far easier to install a web app than it was to do so in Perl at that time. It was much easier to configure for somebody who didn't know programming languages. PHP was a lot easier, and it was much easier for them to maintain. So that's why it's PHP. It worked out well. PHP is... Yes. So these five things that I identified, there's a web page. Um, it, it's part of the documentation. It's like every, in every PMWiki site, you get a copy of the documentation, and it contains the PMWiki philosophy. And these five things, if I had to identify anything that made it successful, it was the fact that we defined our philosophy at the outset, that we defined what the principles are for this software, and we published it, and we stuck to it. That was incredibly important. It was the fundamental success in being able to build a community around PMWiki, because there were many people who would come and look at the software and they wanted to take it in a direction that wasn't compatible with these particular principles. And, or they would suggest a feature and many of us would say, well, we're not sure if it should go in and others would say, yeah, it should. And we could always come back to these principles and we could look for 90% of the features. We could go through and say, does it fit with the PMWiki philosophy? And if it didn't, we threw it out. And if it did, then we would say, okay, we can accept it. It became, um, it became something that people understood. This is what the core purpose of this particular package was, and we weren't going to try and expand beyond that. Um, so it was really, really the most important pack, uh, aspect of this development, because it focused our, in, our effort, it focused what our ambition was for this package, and it limited it. It said, we're not trying to, uh, we're not trying to take on Wikimedia. We're not trying to build the next Wikipedia. Um, we're not interested in all of the other social things that wikis were being interested in doing. We focused primarily on using wiki technology for creating websites. Um, in creating this, there were several other organizations that I found inspirational, that I drew from in trying to maintain this particular package. So in Perl, there was the notion of there's more than one way to do it or Tim Toady, as we say it. Um, and that was a, an underlying theme for PMWiki, is to tell people we're not going to try and box people into only one way of doing things. There's always more than one way to solve a problem. Let's support that as much as we can. Um, Linux was another very uh, key inspiration for that, which is how do we um, support a very tight core with only a few contributors, but still have a lot of people being able to add their own features in. And in Linux, at the time, they did that with kernel modules, where there was a really tight notion of kernel space, uh, user space, and a lot of hooks on which people could create their own modules and bring them into Linux. And another one was Southwest Airlines, um, the airline company. Uh, because uh, I had done some research on businesses and organizations and what made them successful, and I was really enamored of S Southwest Airlines. And again, this is a thing that I think is important. It, it, it's weird to be talking about an airline company in the context of open source, but there are so many commonalities here that it's just something that inspired me. Um, if you're not familiar with Southwest Airlines, they're a US-based carrier. Um, they're a low-cost carrier, so I think the equivalent would be something like Ryanair or something like that um, over here in, in, uh, in Europe. Um, and one of their core principles, one of the big things about them that made them um, special is they said, we're not trying to become the biggest airline company there is. That's not even in their goal set. We're not trying to serve every city. We're not trying to serve every market. 
Um, we're going to focus on the markets that we can serve, and we're going to do those really, really well. So they didn't care about being the dominant player in the market. Totally said, that's not what we're about. Um, what they wanted to focus on was connecting people, building up a culture, and doing low-cost airlines. And if you know Southwest Airlines in the United States, they have done 42 consecutive years of profit. No losses in 42 years. And in the airline industry, that's unheard of in the United States for a company to be so successful uh, when you consider all of the various upheavals and things that they continue, are continually profitable uh, year after year after year after year. Um, it's really, really impressive. Um, I also brought down a copy of their guidelines um, that they have. And they are a company that is all about having fun. So that goes back to my first part. And you can see that that's like their third one here, a fun-loving attitude. And their number one bullet point is have fun. This is a organization that has fun as one of the things that they do. Um, their flight attendants will sing songs to you on the airlines. They will um, decorate their gate areas in all sorts of different costumes and different themes um, just for fun uh, because they think it promotes a really good experience. And they're all about collaboration and doing lots of other things. But for them, it's all about community. It's all about people. It's all about having fun. And that's always been a nice little um, surprise for me. So principles are very important to me. And when we look at uh, free and um, uh, free as in uh, cost and free as in freedom uh, sorts of things, um, it's all organized around principles in the, in the open source community as well. And those principles are what power the community, just like they did for PMWiki in powering it that we have some common shared principles that people recognize, and people participate in it without necessarily being, being aware of what all of those principles are from time to time. So of course there are the four freedoms, which I just listed here. But these are like the philosophy, the foundation of open source that have come up, which is uh, open source means you have the freedom to run software, you have the freedom to study it, you have the freedom to change it, um, you have the freedom to give it out to others. You know, these are your freedoms that you have when you are in the open source software. And you get a lot of other benefits from that as well. Um, there's some other common uh, uh, free and open source um, principles um, that have evolved over time that are pretty well known. So one of them is rough consensus and running code. That this is the way we do development, right? We put things together, we apply patches, we build up software, um, but we do it very interactively. And we kind of get everybody to somewhat agree, you know, this is the way it should go, but running code is the way that we achieve things. It's the way that decisions get made is because it works. Um, scratching a developer's personal itch, um, that people are involved in open source communities because there's, they have a particular problem they're trying to solve for themselves. And the parts that they work on solve a problem for themselves. Uh, another one is uh, release early and release often. Another one is many eyes make all bugs shallow. There's lots of these different principles that come up that really help to define what it means when we say open source. So now we get to Perl 6 and what my talk was really supposed to be about in the first place. So in, growing in the shadows of success. Now keep all of that stuff that I talked about fun and principles in mind and some of those principles, and you'll see some very, very stark things as I look back on the development of Perl 6. So Perl 6 begins with Perl 5. So Perl 5 was a successful language, is a successful language. It's very, very successful. And in the late 1990s and going into the early 2000s, it was the language of the internet. I mean, everyone just knew that if you were doing anything on the World Wide Web, you were using Perl. Somewhere in there, Perl was being used. Companies would deny that they were using Perl because they didn't want people to know they were using Perl, but they were really using Perl. Um, it was by far one of the most popular platforms for doing any sort of uh, CGI on the web um, and um, uh, database stuff. And it has these phrases, these mottos associated with it, such as being the Swiss Army chainsaw of scripting languages. That you could take Perl and you could make it do anything, and it was like this power tool that could do anything. Um, also, it was known as the duct tape that holds the internet together. That the internet was basically running on Perl. 
Anybody disagree with that? That that's the way things were? Anybody remember that as being the heyday of Pearl? What Pearl was like? So Pearl 5, at around the time of the year 2000, was the king of languages. It was incredible. But they also saw problems. They saw the writing on the wall. They said, you know what? We can't go much farther with Pearl. Pearl's got some fundamental issues with it, Pearl 5 does, that we don't see a way to overcome. So we need to do something somewhat drastic, so let's create Pearl 6. So Pearl 6 was announced in July of 2000, and the whole point in the announcement was, let's get rid of the parts of Pearl that everybody complains about. Let's get rid of its warts. Let's get rid of those things that make it hard for people to use and come up with a language that is, has all the power of Perl without all of the warts of Perl um, to be able to do that. And uh, so they started what's called the RFC process. The RFC's process, request for comments, was for Perl programmers and Perl enthusiasts to suggest how would you change the language? What would you change? If you could change anything, what would be one of the important things you would change? And Larry says, he expected to get about 20 of these, 20 changes that people would make, and he got 361. Um, and when you look through the 361, they contradicted each other. So somebody would submit a change that says, we should do this, and somebody submitted a change that says, we should do this other thing, and those two things could not live in harmony um, with the way that they were being looked at. So, and many of them were incompatible with Perl 5. They said, we should change this about Perl 5, or, but there was no way to do it. It just was not going to be able to happen. And so shortly thereafter, after looking at all of the RFCs, they said, we're going to have to design Perl 6 to be incompatible with Perl 5. It's not an upgrade, it's a rewrite. So um, it's an incompatible break, we're breaking backwards compatibility. That's unheard of in the software industry, right? I mean, how often do you actually get to say and declare we're breaking backwards compatibility with our already successful project or already successful product? Yes? Yeah. Yeah. P uh, PHP introduces bugs. Uh, yes. PHP does it as well. And I had one here. I have heard about Microsoft. They do. They do. Um, uh, a fair bit of backwards compatibility, but in their defense, if you, can, if you looked at it from Microsoft's perspective, at how much compatibility they've managed to preserve across all of their operating systems, going all the way back to 3.1, it's actually pretty incredible, right? Um, they, they've done a lot more. They certainly have done a lot more than we planned to do with Perl 6. So, um, so it would be this incompatible break, and the expected timeline is that Perl 6 would be ready by Christmas. So if you look at Perl 5, again, early 2000s, had a huge market share. CPAN was the envy of everybody. Everybody thought CPAN was the incredible stuff, got it. Um, there was a heavy focus in the Perl community on enterprise and production deployment because more and more businesses were using Perl and they're starting to see the warts and say, how can we get rid of these particular warts? Um, particular things, uh, desire to improve the way packages were being handled and modules, make CPAN better, lots of these things. And the Perl community had, um, at the time, it still has, some incredibly brilliant designers, hackers, and developers. I mean, if you look at some of the stuff that people like Damian Conway were putting together, it's just completely mind-blowing and boggling and amazing. And so there was a sense, a confidence that we can do this. Perl 6 is this incredible thing that we can do. We know what needs to be done. We can get it done. So some key uh, Perl 6 goals. There's a freedom to break compatibility. All of the things where you say, we can't do that because it'll break compatibility, those are off the table have a lot of freedom in the design. We can get rid of the historical warts, like the way that sigils changed you know, depending on how you used them. Um, it was, in Perl 5, the language specification is the implementation. They are completely tied together. If you say what the language is and how it's defined, you go look at how it's implemented, that defines it. 
Um, and that has some advantages, but it has some disadvantages as well. Um, most languages, you like to have your specification be separate from your implementation. And so Perl 6, there was a conscious decision at the outset. Let's make a specification and not have it be tied to a single implementation. Um, incorporate a bunch of new programming ideas, which if you go to any of the Perl 6 talks or talk to one of the Perl 6 folks, we can tell you all about those. And that this would be a language that would be designed for 50 or more years. In other words, 50 years from now, in the year 2050, you would still find it being an active language that people used and talked about and developed in. And if you think about that in the context of the history of computer science and computer languages, that's an audacious goal. I mean, a 50-year language would be that people actively use. Um, the only 50-year languages that exist today would be things like COBOL and Fortran. And yes, there are people who use them, but that's not the sense in which that we wanted to say that. We wanted to say something much stronger. So that's pretty audacious to say we want a language that will last longer than the history of languages. So Perl 6 begins. So Perl 6 began by having Larry, the head of the Perl development effort, analyze the RFCs, and he publishes what are called the apocalypses. These are the revealing thoughts as he's thinking what this language is going to look like, and he publishes it for comment and review and for people to discuss. Um, those were then summarized into what are called the synopses. The synopses were summaries of what the language would look like. And people just began to start treating them as the language specification. And then the developers could then go from the synopses, which describe the language, and begin to build the actual compilers and the tools that would implement the language by Christmas. Oops. <laughs> so hold that in there, because I'm going to come right back to that little process. But let's look at what the software engineering process looks like. And I stole this from Paul Vixie, um, who published this in uh, Open Source Vo Voices, which was a book about the open source movement published in 1999. And um, Paul Vixie said, these are the basic elements of how you do software design. So you start with marketing requirements. You go and ask your market, what is it that you need? and you get all the needs back in. And you come back and you do system level design where you take all those needs and you start to do a high level design of how things are going to go together. And then you do a detailed design which has all of the specifications of all the modules and how it's all gonna fit together. And then you start implementation, you do integration, field testing, and support, and you do them in this order. All right, so let's look at the Perl 6 design process because we're Perl, or we're Perl, right? We're grown up, we know what we're doing, we're gonna follow this process. So in Perl 6, we started with the RFCs. Those were the marketing requirements. And then we're going to do system level design. That was the apocalypses, the analysis that went together. And out of those came the synopses, which were the specification documents that describe how it's going to do. And then we start with implementation, which were these things like Parrot and Pugs and a variety of other things that are there. And after that becomes integration, which was, well, we didn't get to that part. Um, and then there's field testing, and we didn't get to that part. And then there's support and so forth. And um, we never got there. We never got past this part, right? Anybody know what we did wrong? Did anybody see it? We followed the darn thing. That's not open source at all. This is the way that people did software engineering before open source. The very area where we were the most successful, we chose a process, not knowingly, but we ended up selecting a process and doing things in the way that were the ways that things would be done before we had open source. That's not really that good. So it started slowing down. The whole traditional way of things happened slowed down, right? Um, we underestimated the challenges evolved. We started promising that we could deliver on things that we didn't know if we could do, deliver on. There was very little visibility to the outside world. And we followed the standard feature-based release strategy. So a feature-based release strategy is you don't come up with a new version of something. You don't release it until you have some features involved. You say, the next version will have X, Y, and Z, and then when you have X, Y, and Z, you do a release. Right? So we did a feature-based release strategy, and the end result of that is you get increasing, increasing time lags between releases. And all of this leads to fear, uncertainty, and doubt, or FUD as it's known. And these are the kinds of things that started to be said about Perl 6 and its development. For one, we, people were identifying Perl 6 is the successor to Perl 5. 
this is what everyone will move to off of Perl 5. Perl 5 will go away. That's not true, but that's what people would think about it. And that when Perl 6 come out, it's going to have everything that Perl 5 has. By Christmas, what we produce will have everything that Perl 5 has, plus, you know, ability to do CPAN and all that kind of stuff. And it took longer, and so people said, when will it be finished? And it took longer and longer, and they said, well, there's obviously something wrong, and the problem is they haven't finished the specification yet. You've got to get the specification finished. Freeze it, just whatever it is now, freeze it so that you can release Perl 6. Um, and uh, then it took a while and things went on and Python's getting more popular and this new language came up called Ruby and everybody's like, oh, Perl 6 has missed its chance. You know, they could have done it if they'd done it in a couple of years like they said they would have, but now it's not going to go anywhere. Um, not only that, but by Perl 6 being there, it's hurting Perl. It's hurting the old one that we have. Let's don't get rid of it. So just release Perl 6 now. We don't care what it is. How bad it is, just release it. Get something out there. And then uh, it still didn't come out. And they said, oh, Perl 6, it's vaporware. It's the Duke Nukem forever of programming languages, which was the most popular humorous comment about Perl 6 for the longest time. And then finally, put the Perl 6 devs to work on Perl 5 instead, right? They're wasting their time on that. Just switch them all over and get them to fix up Perl 5 again. That one bugged me the most. Does this sound open source? It is not open source at all. And yet this is what many people in the community were saying. They were saying as if Perl 5 was a business, a closed source shop with employees that you could retarget to do whatever you needed to do. Now these weren't the leaders, you know, these weren't the leaders saying this, but the people in the community, many people in the community were basically saying, we should have the ability to tell the developers what they should be working on. And we should be able to assign them to that. It's not open source. <laughs> the point is, in open source, it's developers scratching their own itch. The people working on, on Perl 6 are doing it because they have an interest in Perl 6. Almost none of them were very interested in working on Perl 5. That's why they started in Perl 6, is because they didn't think Perl 5 was going to do anything. But the community as a whole had adopted, because of their success, this notion that we're like a Microsoft. We're like a traditional software company. And that is the model that they used in order to say how the community should progress. Our community basically used Perl 5's previous success in the marketplace to define the frame going back to what Simon said yesterday in his keynote, framing. That's what framed the discussions, is Perl 6's success depends on how it compares to what Pre Perl 5 did when it was at its height. That's a, tough, that's a tough thing to do in any environment. It's really tough in open source. Um, we also lost our way on many of the fun, uh, fundamentals. Um, and you, I've already gone through some of this, so I can skip it. But this is back to my earlier slide, and the things that aren't here, there's no rough consensus in running code in this development process. There's no notion of release early, release often. They were feature-based releases. Um, they, um, we forgot that in the internet and in language design, you don't start with a spec and then implement it. You start with implementations and you document them. That's the way the internet works. That's the way languages, at least the ones that have been successful work, is you get a language that works, that people use, and then you make the specification for the language. Um, we were no longer scratching personal itches. Um, we were forgetting that the notion of when will something be finished, finished is never a line. It's not a mark because software is never finished. Languages are never finished. They're always evolving. It's a continuum. Um, so these are the things that, that we forgot. And it hurt the development effort because we got away from the principles that had gotten the success of Perl and other open source languages and environments in the first place. However, hindsight's 2020. It's easy for me to stay up and stand up here now and say, oh, you know, that's the way things were. Um, it's easy for me to say that because I can look back on things. Um, and, but at the time, many of us, myself included, were blind to this is what we were doing. We're not alone in this, by the way. I mean, it's not unique to Perl. Um, Python had a similar sort of thing that they said, we need to redesign Python. And they have Python 2 and Python 3. 
Um, Python 3, of course, was released um, many years ago. Um, but the Python community is now struggling with how do they get everybody to move from Python 2 to Python 3. That is one of their criteria for success, is trying to get everybody to move. And some of us looking externally think that's a mistake. Uh, we're not doing that with Perl 5 and Perl 6. Perl 5 will continue to, to exist for as long as people want it to. Um, PHP uh, 5, um, they decided they needed better Unicode support, so they defined PHP 6 and said this is what we're going to do for PHP 6. They discovered it was really hard, and so they went back to PHP 5 and threw away PHP 6 and a variety of other things. Ruby is now doing it with Crystal. So this is not unique to Perl. Um, all of the different languages that came up in the early 2000s are now going through this struggle. Um, and I think Perl 6 is got other things right that means that we will actually survive, we will actually thrive in the future. For one, we have this notion of focusing on fun. Fun is a big part of what we do in Perl 6. Um, secondly, we are focused on the long term. So how many of you have heard the phrase that uh, in any engineering project you can do something good, fast or cheap, pick any two? Right? How many of you believe that to be true? Cool, right? So in open source, if you have volunteers, you have to do cheap. Don't have a choice. Right? Unless you have a lot of money, you have to do cheap. So guess what? Pick any one of the remaining two. So you can either have it quickly or it can be good. Which one do you want? You only get to pick one. Well, okay, well, which one will you pick? Good. That's what Perl 6 has chosen. Perl 6 has always chosen good over fast because we want to be the 50-year language, and good is the only way to get there. Um, we've done specification separate, where our language definition is based on tests, that's an executable language definition. Um, within the Perl 6 uh, community, we see community and culture as being as important as code, because we know that it's a culture, it's a community that we're building, that we're redefining as much as a language. And so if you go into the Perl 6 channel on IRC, you will discover they're incredibly friendly. We don't. We don't have the problem of, or we try not to, and we certainly exclude, um, we, when it occurs that a newbie comes in with a question and somebody else says, you know, you're a newbie, you should have gone to read the documentation, there are usually a few other people in there who say, no, we don't act that way. That's not the way that we treat the people who are trying to learn this language. Um, a variety of other things. Um, other things that we're now getting right, we now know that language definition comes after working implementations. Um, we're starting to understand the history and the evolution of what it takes to do a language. Anybody who believes that a language that you've worked on for five years is going to have all of the features, like Perl 5, of something that's 25 years old, is probably not going to happen. They're both evolving. And so there will always be some catch up. Um, it's never been the case that I'm aware of where a 1.0 version of a language was finished. It was usually very early in the process. Um, our um, Success measurement is by the overall growth of people using Perl. We're not measuring by how many people we steal from Perl 5. That's not interesting to us. It's not really that important. We're not really worried about how much market share does Perl 6 have in the overall world. The question that I always have is like the Southwest Airlines question. Am I meeting my goals? Am I making a profit? You know, where, whatever your definition of profit is, that's the important thing. Um, the other thing that we need to do and that I'm committing to do is much like I did for PM Wiki with the PM Wiki philosophy is come up with a page that says these are the Perl 6 values. These are the things that are important to us because I think that's something that's been missing from our community. So when will Perl 6 be released? Um, Recuto Perl 6 has had monthly releases since 2008. It's available now. You can download it. You can run it. It's really good. Um, an official release comes up later this year that will be called the official release of Perl 6. That's where we will have the first official version of the language spec along with the compiler um, being able to uh, happen. If you want to, it will be in December of 2015. I'm pretty sure it will be before Christmas of 2015. Of this year, Christmas of this year. If not, you can fire me. <laughs> so what are the lessons? Because I know I'm almost out of time. What are the lessons here? So I hear and I agree with the notion that if you look in the marketplace, open source has won the battle, right? Companies use open source. It powers the internet. 
um, open source, if you look at it in its battle against closed source, then yes, open source is here to stay. It's not going anywhere. But as we've seen with Perl 5, we have to really be careful about being complacent in saying we've won, we're done. Because it's really easy to forget your principles. It's really easy to forget the things that got you there. And I have an entire language, a huge language, and a bunch of really smart people that apparently did this as I look back. And that's kind of the message that I have is um, define your core principles. We have that in the open source definition, but the people who are involved in open source have to keep them in mind. Um, and um, the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. So in order to keep open source around, in order for it not to be co-opted by something else, in order for open source to, um, because we talk about it in terms of software, but now we have content, we have media, we have all sorts of other patent issues that are coming on. We have to be vigilant, we have to be careful and make sure that our values aren't being co-opted by other interests in ways that we didn't expect when they were first put together. And that's my talk.